And I declare over your life today, Grace Church of the Nazarene, that if it feels like you're in a wilderness, if it feels like you're struggling, I declare that it is only because of the fact that God is about to do something brand new in your life. Anybody in here believe that today? Welcome to Grace Church of the Nazarene's virtual service. This morning, be blessed by our praise and worship experience and a life-changing message by our senior pastor, Rev. Coley Theok, on the topic, Focused Faith. If you are impacted by this morning service in any way, feel free to join us every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. for midweek prayer and Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for morning worship in Hannah Hill, 8 Mile Rock. Also, we would love your support in helping us take the gospel to the world. So go ahead and click the subscribe button below. Comment and share today's broadcast. Be blessed. Will we take this word? And use it, not abuse it, but use it to better further our lives. Bless the praise team, Lord, that is going to usher us in the presence of the Lord. Lord, will we come with a mind to worship you this morning? Will we forget about everything else and concentrate on you and worship you? Bless the service right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, oh, oh. 
establish the fact that when we look in the Gospels, one of the major events that we're waiting to happen, or one of the things that we're waiting for to happen is actually the rapture. For those who don't know what the rapture is, it's a point in time in history when Jesus is coming back to earth to take all the faithful Christians off of the face of the earth. And I said this the last time, or one of the times I preached on this series, because we actually in part nine. But when Jesus comes back, he's not coming to back to see if you are in church. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming to see if you are on the streets feeding the poor, clothing the naked. When Jesus comes back, the only thing he's coming to look back for to see is if we're going to be living and operating in a life of faith in him. Because the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, or when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on the earth? And with that in mind, as you sit there, 
I think one of the things that you have to begin to think about or consider is where is your faith level? Where is your faith level at this point when it comes to the things of God? Where is your faith? Is your faith in God? Are you trusting in God? Are you being consistent and persistent in trusting the facts concerning God for your life? Or you're on the opposite side where you're not operating in faith. Well, if the rapture was to happen right now and our life is not a one of faith, we're going to get left behind. I mean, sorry to say like that, but if we're not operating and living in faith, we're going to be left behind because when Jesus comes back, he's coming for a group of persons who are living and operating in a life of faith. If you understand that, say amen. Now, for the next few weeks, as a sub-theme, we're going to be looking at focus faith in the wilderness. Focus faith in the wilderness. Now, I've preached about the wilderness experience for a few times as a young preacher. And when I began preparing for this particular message... There was a lot of things I had to rearrange in my mind because I re already had a preconceived understanding of what it means to be in the wilderness. But when I began studying, it's like God kind of had to re-teach me. And he taught me some things that I never considered. And I promise you, if you stay for the end of this message, that what God is about to say today is going like, to blow your mind because it blew my mind. Just crazy and amazing as I even think about it standing here, what God has revealed to me from this particular topic, it's mind-blowing. And so I hope that you receive it and you don't be distracted. But church, how many of you know that many times to prove that we are truly sons and daughters of God, there are times when God will allow us to go through a wilderness experience. In other words, there are times when God wants to test you, he wants to test me, to see if we really are who we say we are. We call ourselves sons and daughters of God. And so to prove that, what God sometimes does is he places us in situations where it feels as if we are in a wilderness. In other words, it's easy to call ourselves a Christian or a child of God when things are going good, not a princess. When the car can right, when the bank account looking right, when the marriage is legit, when the relationships are fine, when everything is a bed of roses, it's easy in those moments in time to say, I'm a child of God, and God approves of me, and God loves me. And it is during the times when we're struggling. Our back is against the wall where we begin to question our faith. Like, God, am I really a son? Am I really a daughter? With all these things going on around in my life, am I really and truly a child of God? Because everyone else is getting their blessing, but it seems as if, God, you're forgetting me. Now, to properly understand focus faith in the wilderness, then we must get a clear understanding of what the wilderness actually is. See, physically or geographically, a desert is not a wilderness, and a wilderness is not a desert. Don't let that fly over your head. A wilderness is not a desert, nor is a desert a wilderness. See, before I began studying, I thought that a desert and a wilderness were the same thing. But they are not. But see, a desert describes a climate in which it hardly rains. Most deserts are hot. Most deserts are dry. Most deserts have a lot of sand and very few plants. And so on the map, we have what is called the Sahara Desert. The reason why it's called a desert is because the climate, it hardly rains. It's hot, it's dry, and there are few plants, so they call it the designated the Sahara Desert. Now, on the other hand, a wilderness describes a place where humans have no presence. The wilderness only has wild animals. 
Wilderness can be a dry place, but a wilderness can also include forests and jungles. And some of us are familiar with the movie Tarzan. When you think about Tarzan, I just learned this, Tarzan actually grew up in the wilderness. See, we see Tarzan in the jungle, we think he in the, we call it a jungle or whatever, but that's actually a wilderness. Because there were no humans. He actually grew up with wild animals, and that is why he was sliding on the trees, swinging like an animal. You think about the jungle book. Mowgli grew up with animals. He was actually in the wilderness. And so, not only is it dry terrain, the wilderness, but jungles and forests can also be designated as wilderness because once a place does not have a human being, that is considered a wilderness. Now, from the natural understanding of a wilderness, which is a place where there are no humans but wild animals, theologians have developed a term known as a wilderness experience. And based on my reading, I learned that a wilderness experience is usually thought of as a tough time in which a believer endures discomfort and trials. Based on my reading, I learned that during a wilderness experience, the pleasant things of life are unable to be enjoyed. Or they may be absent altogether. And one, during the, uh, the wilderness experience, sometimes when you're in the wilderness experience, you feel a sense of discouragement. A wilderness experience is often a time of intensified temptation and spiritual attack. It can involve spiritual, listen to me, can involve financial or even an emotional drought. Because when you're going through a wilderness experience, it feels as if there's a lot of chaos around you. Spiritually, financially, emotionally. Come on, say amen if you know what I'm talking about. Anyone been there? That's only me probably. Yeah. It just feels that way. Some of us are there right now. Now, Grace Church of the Nazarene virtual audience, I want to suggest to you that this theological idea or truth of a wilderness experience has been around for centuries. As a matter of fact, based on my research, I discovered that there's an exhausting compilation of articles, books, commentaries, and literature on the topic of wilderness experience. And so it is clear that a wilderness experience is a very common thing. But what amazed me when I thought about it is that as common as a wilderness experience is, watch this, we dislike and we avoid talking about having a wilderness experience. See, when God is blessing me, I can talk with that. I can go on social media and say, look at my brand new car that the Lord has blessed me with. Look at my brand new house God has blessed me with. Because when we experience favor in our opinion and blessings, especially in material things, it's easy for me to go and what we call brag on God. We could talk with that. But how often when we are going through, are we placed in a position where we want to mention the willingness that we are in? But see, I believe, Grace Church of the Nazarene, that God wants to develop a culture in the body of Christ where it's normal for me to get up and tell you not only about the good things that God is doing in my life, but God wants to get us to a place where, and he wants to get us and help us develop a culture where I can be free and honest enough and come and say, right now, church, it feels like I'm in a wilderness. Can we get there as a church? Where we can be open and honest enough and say, I can't only just brag about the good, but I can also mention the bad things that God is allowing to happen in my life. But see, I understand the church culture because... Many of us hesitate to share when we're in the wilderness because church people too like to judge you. Amen. Say amen. amen. Because in the culture of the church, when something bad is happening to you, it must seem mean like Job in Sunday school. You did something wrong and so God is not pleased with you. Amen. So we have a culture now where I can't be open with what I'm going through and so I go in my little bubble and shell and I allow the devil to dismantle me because I can't stand up and be honest with my brothers and sisters and say, y'all pray for me because right now the devil is coming against me and I don't know if I'm going to win. Amen. Can you all handle that level of transparency? 
See, for some reason, and I want to make a personal conclusion. This is my personal conclusion. For some reason, when someone is going through a wilderness experience, we assume that something is wrong with that person. Church, we need to get real about times in our lives when we are having a wilderness experience. Here is why. See, church, we must understand that a wilderness experience is actually ordained by God. You all just missed that. A wilderness experience is approved and stopped by saying, God, God says, I approve of this wilderness experience that you're going through. It's, it's God's approval as to why we're struggling and what we're going through. God approves of it. In other words, based on scripture, there are times when God led chosen people into a time of isolation and barrenness. And so through a wilderness experience, God isolates us because he desires to begin a new work in us. And I declare over your life today, Grace Church of the Nazarene, that if it feels like you're in a wilderness, if it feels like you're struggling, I declare that it is only because of the fact that God is about to do something brand new in your life. Anybody in here believe that today? I believe that with all my heart that if you're struggling, if it feels like your back is against the wall, it's only an indication that God says, I'm about to birth and bring to pass something new in your life that the world has not, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Come on, do I have a witness up in here? Hold on, I ain't ready to preach yet. I still teaching. I just threw it in there, but I still teaching. See, the truth of the matter, church, is that we don't like struggling. Say amen. We don't like going through the wilderness. And the truth is that because we don't like the idea of God allowing us to go through a season. Watch it. It's a season. Say this ain't going to last forever. Because we don't like the idea of God allowing me to go through a season of isolation, struggling, and being in a place of barrenness. What we have done is that we have placed all kinds of distractions around us. And we place all kinds of distractions around us because we want to keep ourselves busy so that we can somehow ignore the reality that right now we're going through a struggle. So we go home, we turn on Netflix, we got our phone in our hand, we always on WhatsApp, we always on Facebook and Instagram. Why? We're trying to keep ourselves busy to ignore the fact that I'm in a wilderness right now. And so with all of the distractions we have set up around us and with all the entertainment and all the outings we have, after work we got to go to this one party. After, on Tuesday we got to go to this one baby something. On Wednesday we got to do a little another thing. And then on Friday we got to be, it's like we always have something to do. We want to keep ourselves busy so that we can avoid the fact that right now we're in the wilderness because we want to somehow block and shield the reality that I'm going through right now. So the first thing for me to do is get myself busy. And that, and you know, and so it's like, I want to keep going nonstop. Because I want to avoid that fact. I'm struggling. I'm going nonstop to the point that we think that we could take God on the move with some Bible or devotional app. Say Amen. We're so busy now, we download now and say, Lord, I'm so busy, let me download this Bible app. I know some of you all have it because I hear it too, because I have it too. It's the, you know, the Catholic ding, dong, dong, ding. When you have that, when I hear that, I know you have the Bible app on your phone. Because we think that because we're so busy, when we hear that sound, that's an indication for us to stop what we're doing and read something encouraging that's supposed to inspire us. But I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when that go off, I'm so busy, I just close it out and say, I can read it later. I mean, the next time I open it, another day or two pass. Because you have to understand that the Bible app can't substitute for you having a personal and intimate relationship with God. I'm not knocking it down. I'm saying, yes, it's important. I'm not saying delete it out your Phone, it has its place, but nothing can replace or, or, or duplicate a wilderness experience that God has to allow you to go through. Say amen. amen. See, for some of us, we think that coming to church once a week is going to keep us focused after being busy with our idols. After a whole week of being busy with idols, we think that, well, once I come to church this week, then that had that, you know, I focus now. But the truth of the matter, church, is that there, there comes a point when God has to shut everything down around us 
where he drives us in isolation, where we must make a choice either we will focus our faith on him or we're going to focus our faith on the cares of this world. Church, I don't know about you, but I observed even in my personal life that there are times when I allow circumstances and situations, good and bad, to drive me away from God bit by bit. If we are not careful, there is this human element tied to our spiritual makeup where our flesh would seek to slowly make us drift further and further away from God. And so God in his wisdom has instituted a course that you will not find in a high school curriculum. God has implemented a subject that you won't find on a college syllabus. Someone say amen. amen. God has implemented a course of study to keep us from drifting too far away from him. And this course, church, is a course that every believer at different season, seasons of our lives, all of us are going to have to take this course. And the course that I'm talking about is a wilderness experience where God turns everything off around us so that he could pull us and draw us back to him. Come on, say amen. And so in our key verse here in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, we find Jesus, the Son of God, is now about to have his wilderness experience. Let me say that again because I fly right over your head. Maybe if I say it a second time, maybe you're going to get it. Jesus, the Son of God, is now about to have his wilderness experience. You all ain't get it, so let me give it to you one more time. Jesus who is the son of God, is now about to have his wilderness experience. See, you thought that you were so special that you could be exempted from hard times. Well, in the text we find Jesus, the son of God, the one who sat at the right hand of the father, who came down in flesh, but yet he's God man. It's complicated, it's hard to explain, but Jesus was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. Yet this man who was 100% God, if he had to go through a wilderness experience, then that means everyone up in here, you're going to find yourself one day or another. I don't care you young right now and things are going good. But at some point in your life, you're going to find yourself like Jesus where God say, now it's time for you to go to a time of testing. Now it's time for you to go to a time of struggling. Because Jesus went through it, then every last one of us got to experience it. Say amen to that. And so the Son of God is about to step into his wilderness experience. But I want to put some things in perspective so you can understand what's going on here. See, this is amazing because in the previous chapter, Luke chapter 3, we see something amazing happen. Jesus was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And when Jesus was baptized, watch this, he received the power of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus received the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the witnesses or those who saw when Jesus got baptized, all of the people who saw it, they all heard a loud voice that declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Don't let that fly over your head. Because you've got to understand that these people some experience something that was so supernaturally intense that it will blow your mind if you were there. Can you imagine if you were there when Jesus was baptized? And then out of nowhere, you see the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove, landing on Jesus' head and filling him with power. And then out of nowhere, no music, no sound system, you hear a loud voice out of nowhere and it said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Because now the people are actually hearing the audible voice of the father directly from heaven. These people experience something so supernatural to the point that when I read that I say, Lord, why do I always read this text? Like it's something so simple, like yeah, a voice talk and the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But if you understood what actually took place, you would understand that these people experience a supernatural experience that you and I probably have never experienced before. They heard the father talk directly to the son and they were right there hearing the voice of the father 
This is amazing. And so before we come here to Luke chapter 4, one chapter earlier, Jesus had what I want to call his mountaintop experience. He's baptized. The people watching saw the supernatural. The Holy Spirit landed on Jesus. They see Jesus filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then out of nowhere, they hear a voice declaring that Jesus is not some ordinary man. No, the voice confirms that Jesus is the Son of God. The one who sat on the throne at the right hand of the Father. The voice echoed from the heavens. Jesus is the Son of God and I'm pleased with him. So in the previous chapter, Jesus is having his mountaintop experience. Some of us in here know what I mean by mountaintop experience. It is that moment when we sense and feel that we are at the peak of experiencing the power and the approval of God in our lives. It may have been when we witnessed the birth of our child. Mountaintop experience. Our mountaintop experience may have been getting a scholarship. Your mountaintop experience might be you getting a new job or promotion. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Our mountaintop experience may have been falling in love and getting married. Our mountaintop experience it may have been when we got the call for the property or the house. It could have been when the doctor said somehow, some way, you were sick but now you're healed. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Our mountaintop experience may have been when we had a supernatural encounter with God. In other words, at some point on this Christian walk, we have a mountaintop experience where we feel the hand and the move of God in our lives. If you've ever been there, say amen. Because they're all acting like y'all ain't been there. <laughs> okay, let me put it another way. Has God blessed anybody up in here before? Come on, if he blessed you before, give him some praise, man. That's your mountaintop experience. Okay, let me put it another way. Has God been good to anybody up in here? Come on. But give him a mountaintop praise if you know he's been good to you. Come on, think back. Come on, some of y'all need to think back. Think back at a mountaintop experience. You were believing God. You were saying, God, how are you going to work this out? And then out of nowhere, boom, the Lord show up. And then you had a crazy praise in your room. And you were shouting and you were singing. And you know you were looking crazy to the point that, Lord, I can't act like this in church. But something in you was so excited because your God made a way out of nowhere. Mama couldn't help you. Daddy couldn't help you. Pastor couldn't help you. But oh, when the Lord touched it, when the Lord put his hands on it, something had to break and what was stopping you from your blessing the lord had to come through with all of his power and now i can declare lord you made a way anybody up in here know what i'm talking about has the lord made a way for anybody up in you all better give god praise has the lord made a way for anybody up in here Okay, Rose, only me and you know what you're talking about. I don't know how this is going to work out. Man, I need this money right now. <laughs> oh, Lord, the doctor gave me a bad report, and they got to do a surgery on my little daughter. Lord, what are you going to do right now? But oh, something on the inside of me. When the doctor said, we ain't got to cut her open no more. Because whatever we thought was there, it ain't there no more. And so I left that hospital with a prayer. Oh, Lord Almighty, you better give God a praise up in here. Oh, God, has the Lord been good to anybody up in here? I feel a celebration coming on. I want to thank you, God. I want to praise you, God. Lord, you are good. And right now, I just want to say thank you. Hey, hey. Lord, you are good. Hallelujah. Oh. 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 That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. I still got to preach. I still got to preach. Hold it right there. 
But when I begin to think about the goodness of God, something in me will just go crazy. That is your mountaintop experience. You better give God praise for it. And I'm standing here and I say, the Lord, if you did it before, you have the power to do it again. Do I have a witness up in here? You can do it again. Because you've been good. And I want to praise you and thank you for it. But they had to shut it down because they still have some work to do. And so, after his mountaintop experience, let's read what happens in the next, in the next verse. Next chapter. And this is where it gets interesting. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, the place of his baptism, the mountaintop experience. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so after his mountaintop experience, I hear music, you could turn that down, please. Thank you very much. After his mountaintop experience, Jesus is now being led into his wilderness experience. Church, we must understand that a wilderness experience is often linked to a mountaintop experience. Say amen. In other words, most times you would find that one after one success comes a struggle. And after one struggle comes success. And the question is, when we transition from mountaintop to wilderness, in other words, when we transition from success to struggle, the question is, will we still have faith in God? When God moves you from mountaintop to struggle, how is your faith? It's easy to praise him on the mountaintop. I never climb a mountain, but I watch videos of people climbing mountains. And one of the things they love to do when they get to the mountain is they love to open up their mouth. Hey! And they hear the echo. Because that's a spiritual representation that on the mountaintop, it's easy to praise God. Do I have a witness up in here? When we're on the mountain and things are going good, and everything is laddie daddy, bed of roses. It's easy for you to come in church and do your Holy Ghost shuffle. Lord, I praise you. We dance it. It's easy for me to praise God. I can't do it, by the way. Amen. It's easy to praise God when things are going good because on the mountaintop, it's exciting. Yes. You get to look at the top of the mountain and look down and shout, and your voice is echoed. But what happens when you're in the valley and the devil got duct tape around your mouth? You're in the valley and he's trying to shut you up. Can you still praise him even with the duct tape on your mouth in the valley? Anyone can praise God when things are going good. But the test is, can you praise him when everything is bleak? Everything is dark. I don't know what's going on, God. Can you praise him in those moments? Now, I want to teach you something from the text. See, this can blow your mind. Because it blew my mind. I hope it blew yours. See, when you look at the word wilderness in this particular verse, it is translated from an Old Testament Hebrew word, midbar, M-I-D-B-A-R. Everyone shout midbar. Okay, it sounds like you're all tired. I only testing to see how tired you're Let's say try that again. Everyone say midbar. Now, when I began studying the word midbar, from where the word wilderness in this particular verse comes from, among the many meanings that I read about, two meanings stood out to me about the translation of this word wilderness. One meaning of the word midbar, it actually means to speak. This is, this is powerful to me. The translation says, wilderness means midbar, which means to speak. Okay, nobody get it yet. Midbar from the word wilderness means to speak. And it carries with it the idea of going to a place of isolation and talking to yourself. Anyone here ever talk to yourself? 
But in the context of this verse, we can see that based on the meaning of midbar for wilderness, it should make us understand that God uses our wilderness experiences to speak to us. Say amen. amen. Praise church of the Nazarene. If you would believe this message today, you would understand that God speaks to us in the wilderness. Say amen to that. Amen. We might be struggling. Our backs may be against the wall. You don't know how this situation is going to work out. But can I tell you today, church, that if we are willing to stop if we are willing to wait, if we are willing to listen, we would hear the Lord speaking to us right there in the midst of our wilderness experience. I don't know if it's just me, but I need the Lord to speak to me. I don't know if it's just me. Do I have a witness up in here? I need the Lord to speak to me. Because see, unless the Lord speak to me, ain't nothing happening. Because when you go and jump in the book of Genesis and you open up the Bible... The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the Bible says that there was chaos. There was nothing. But then something supernatural happened where the word of God says, and then God, what? He spoke and he said. And when God said something, that which was in the spiritual realm manifests itself in the natural realm. So what I'm trying to get you to understand, Grace Church of the Nazarene, is that your wilderness is important because God is trying to get some things from the spiritual realm into your natural environment. Maybe I preach too deep for y'all. Some of y'all ain't get that just now. Anyone in here would admit that the Lord, I long for you to speak to me. Lord, I don't know about anybody else, but I need, I need to hear your voice. Church, I want to submit to you that I believe that God sparks a desire in our soul for us to hear him speak to us so that we will seek him more intentionally. See, we must understand that the Holy Spirit, he stirs in us a craving for deeper engagement with God. And that is why his word says, my sheep know my what? Voice. Why? Because God desires to constantly speak to his children. That's you and me. God says in the book of Jeremiah 33, he says, call to me and I will answer you. And I, the Lord, as I speak to you, God says, I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Church, I don't know about you, but I need God to speak to me because there are some things that God knows that I don't know about. God knows where the next realm is. God knows where the money is. God knows where the favor is. God knows where the blessing is. And the reason why many of us didn't find it yet, because we are not allowing the Lord to speak to us. We waiting on the pastor to speak to us. But God said, there comes a point in your life where I have to put you in the wilderness so that I can speak to you and show you and reveal some things that you did not know about. And so watch this. Focus faith says, I hear the facts concerning my situation speaking to me. The doctor's speaking to me and they tell me that's it. The bank's talking to me and saying, boy, your bank account empty. The, pe the therapist's talking to me and say, you going crazy. But in those moments in time, I need to hear the voice of the Lord and not the voice of the things that I'm going through. Because when the doctors speak to me, I need to hear God's voice that says that by his stripes, I am healed. When the bank account says empty and the bank's calling me and saying, boy, your bank account looking bad. I can hear the voice of the Lord speaking to me and says, and my God shall supply all of my what? needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So I don't need to hear the, the voice of my situations. I need to hear a voice that comes directly from God. As a matter of fact, if focused faith had the ability to ask a question, it would ask you when God speaks, do you believe and trust what he said? Because I believe that God is telling many of us in this room a lot of things concerning our life. But the problem with many of us is that we don't believe the word of God. We don't trust the word of God. We walk in doubt. We walk in fear. We allow what we can see in the natural dimension to hinder what God is saying to us on the inside. But focus faith says, I trust what the Lord says concerning my life. I trust and believe what the word of God says about my life. And so Grace Church virtual audience, one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is to disrupt 
the frequency of God's voice that is speaking to us. It's kind of like when you're on WhatsApp, and I don't know if you all experienced it before, when you're trying to talk to somebody and say hello, and they hear you, I, you can't hear me, I, I, I cut note. And so the point of the mind is that there comes a point in our life, in our spiritual walk, where the enemy will try to block and distort the voice of God concerning our life. And church, I don't know about you, but I need God to speak because I want to hear his report concerning my life because God's report or whatever God has to say concerning my situation is the only report that matters. Does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? We're going to get a lot of reports, but the report that matters most is what the Lord has to say. And so believers, through our wilderness experience, God wants to speak to us because sometimes the only way we can hear God's voice is when he places us in isolation away from all of the busyness and away from all of the noise. Sometimes the only way we can hear God speaking to us is when everything around us becomes barren and we have nowhere else to turn. So I may not like the wilderness, but there is a great reward in the wilderness. I may be uncomfortable comfortable in the wilderness, but it is there that God begins to speak to me. And once I'm in the wilderness and I hear the Lord speak, then I begin to realize that he is the only one who has the answers to all the problems that I'm dealing with. Someone give God a praise for the wilderness. Because you're in the wilderness, you're going to realize that what you're going through and what you are facing with, mama don't have the answer. Google don't have the answer, but it is only the Lord who has an answer for the problems and the situations that we are going through. Anybody in here want to give God a praise for their willingness experience? You better give God a praise for the willingness experience. You better give God a praise for it because that's the only way you're going to get your answer. Your answer ain't going to come when you're praising God and clapping your hands and giving God a shout and a praise. No, sometimes God wants to give you an answer and the only way he's going to send it to you is by sending you in the willingness. Someone say, Lord, thank you for my willingness experience. <laughs> Church, as we examine Luke 4 and 1, this is the conclusion. Not only does the Hebrew word for willingness, midbar means to speak, but another meaning of this word for willingness, midbar, it means to push out or drive away. The idea of this meaning or the image here is similar to, listen to this, it is similar to when a shepherd is out with his animals. And what he's doing is pushing them from behind. And leading them to where he wants them to go. And so Midbar is like a shepherd pushing or driving animals away. Now, this is extremely important, so I want you, don't want you to miss it. See, church, earlier I already explained to you that a wilderness is not a desert, and a desert is not a wilderness. See, in a desert, even though it is dry, in a desert, even though it is hot, even though food is hard to find, in a desert, we can still find people. But see, what makes a wilderness different than a desert is the simple fact that in a wilderness, it is uninhabited. In other words, in a wilderness, there are no people. So if the origin of the word wilderness means to push or drive away, then the idea is that God is driving or pushing us away from something or someone that cannot be found in the wilderness. So suppose you get it. Hopefully you all get it by the, by the time in the next two minutes. And so based on what I just explained, the only thing that cannot be found in the wilderness are people. See, church, the point is that God at times uses a wilderness experience to push or drive us away from certain people. Before Jesus is pushed in the wilderness, he was surrounded by people. But here we see the Holy Spirit driving him away or pushing him to a place where no human could be found. Grace Church of the Nazarene, God says the reason why we got to go through our wilderness experience is because God wants to deliver us from people. Jonathan McReynolds, a well-known gospel artist, artist, says it like this. In the song entitled People, he says, they are the best and the worst you've created. Loving, hating opinionated people. John McReynolds says, God, please deliver me from people. I was sinking deep in the ocean of thoughts they were thinking. Don't know what validation I was seeking. And then John then says it again, God, please deliver me from people. 
Praise church, if there's one thing many of us in this room need deliverance from, many of us in here need to be delivered from people. Can I get an amen? Yeah. You see, some of us need to tell God, God, please deliver us, push us out, drive us away from crazy people. God, please deliver me from lying people. God, please deliver me, like Jonathan says, from self-righteous people. God, please deliver me from entitled people. God, please deliver me from dis disrespectful people. Church, in a wilderness experience, God is pushing us away from people because he needs us in isolation away from any and everyone else. And so God says, I need to get you in isolation and push you away from people. Because for too long, people have been in your airs clouding your judgment. God says for too long, the opinions of other people have been stealing your joy. God says for too long, the things people have done to you have been blocking and keeping you from your destiny. God says today, I'm delivering you from people, Grace Church and the Nazarene. God says, I've called you to be the best Christ-like version of you and not the version of who someone else think you should be. God says, I need to deliver you from people because I need you to be who I call you to be and not what other people think you should be. God says, I'm anointing you to be that man. I'm anointing you to be that woman. And so in order for that to come to pass, I got to put you in isolation because you got to understand that at this point in this ministry, Jesus was about to step out and do something extraordinary. And if God is going to call you to do something extraordinary, then he got to remove you from people who just too ordinary. Go, oh, come on, give God up. That's, that's, that deserves a shot right there. God saying, in order for me to let you do extraordinary, I got to move you from ordinary people. Do I have a witness up in here? God said, if you want to be all of who I call you to be, man, I got to take you away from people. Because sometimes what people think in, the opinions of other people, what my grandparents think about me, what my mommy feel about me, what my daddy feel about me, what great church feel about me, what my neighbors think about me. God said, I got to deliver you from people. And get this, if God is pushing us out, and driving us away. Then that means I have no choice in the matter. I have a choice, but I really don't have a choice. Because if I'm a child or a son of God, then I got to go with God's choice. And so now in my walking into the wilderness, as the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, Jesus had a choice, but he really didn't have a choice. Because he had to submit to the will of his father. And so Jesus now says, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. So if you want to send me in the wilderness, then that's where I'll go. Some of you in here need to understand and stop fighting the fact that God is pushing you in the wilderness. God is pushing you into difficulty. God is pushing you into some hard times. God is pushing you now because God say, I need you to get in isolation because when I begin to do something great in you, you can't worry about what they going to say because I need to get you to a place where you understand what I want you to do. So either you're going to be what they want you to be or you're going to be who I call you to be. And so only to the wilderness experience where you're sitting down and you're all alone and I begin to meditate and talk to you and you begin to speak to me and I begin to speak to you. Then you become inclined and you know my voice. You know how I sound. So even if someone else come to talk to you, a prophet could come from Africa, an apostle could come from Nassau. It doesn't matter what they have to say because you must understand understand that you can't tell me nothing different because you were not there when I was going through. Where were you when I was struggling? Where were you when my back was against the wall? Because God said, I need to confirm the call on your life. I need to confirm the anointing, anointing that is on your life. And so now because I've called you out and now I'm pushing you in when you come out now it's only about what the Lord want me to do. Someone give God a praise up in here. Give God a praise that says, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, not what I want, but God, you can have all of me. Anybody want to give God all of them right now in the name of Jesus? See, for some of us, we've been giving God 50% of us. Some of us have been giving God 70% of us. But God say 80% won't do. 99.9% .9 won't do. God say, I need all of you if I'm going to do what I need to do on the earth in and through you. And so it's going to require some crushing. It's going to require some breaking. It's going to require some demons coming and attacking you from left, right, and center. Because now when you take them blows, it's only going to make you stronger. It's only going to make you wiser. 